you pray with me? <laughs> Good and gracious God, we ask that you would speak to us through your word for this day. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You know, it's hard to describe all the things that our church does um, during the week. Uh, it's, it's really hard. It, uh, it's to focus on all these various activities and different things that happen. Uh, it's quite difficult uh, to do that just on a Sunday morning because we can spend uh, several hours just talking about that, about uh, different emails that we receive, about how somebody was touched by prayer, um, or an email that said, hey, thank you so much uh, for lifting so-and-so in prayer. That meant a lot to us. Or about a sermon that was preached. Um, there's a lot that happens uh, that we don't necessarily share on a Sunday morning here. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to share with you is tomorrow I'm officiating a wedding. Uh, and I love doing weddings. It is one of my favorite things about my job. I just love it. When the bride and groom come and meet with me, they are so idealistic about the future. They're in love. They're walking on clouds. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, and it gives me great joy uh, to be part of their lives during that sacred moment. You know, as I try to talk to them, uh, we meet several times. And one of the things that I do is I say, what do you love about so-and-so? Oh, and there's a smile. They giggle, and they talk about how much they're in love with each other. And then we kind of shift in different topics. And then finally, and say, is there anything that this person does that drives you nuts? Um, and there's a reason why I ask that question. And usually there's a big pause. They're about to get married. They're not going to talk bad about one another, right? There's a pause. There are a lot of hums and hums and, and all that. But in counseling, I learned this. Uh, during those conversations where the couple are talking about one another, or what they complain about, um, all my counseling courses taught me that I shouldn't give my opinion in that matter, right? If they are talking about something, I should just kind of stay out of it and try to provide solutions for them so that they can figure it out. Because the last thing you want one of them to say uh, is, you know what, Pastor Johnson said this was stupid, and I'm right and you're wrong, right? And that ends the conversation and nothing comes good out of it. So I was trained as a counselor never to give my opinion in those moments. So this couple that I'm officiating the wedding tomorrow, you know, they kind of went, mm, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then finally one person said, it drives me nuts when you leave the kitchen cabinets open after you've taken something out. Oh, all of a sudden, like a can of worms opened, right? It was a pretty hot topic, and the body language changed. Everybody got defensive. I'm, and again, I am the non-anxious presence here. My training has prepared me for this moment. And I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm quiet. I'm being very attentive to what is, this person is saying. And this person who committed the crime of opening the cabinet said, well, I don't see kitchen cabinets being open, okay? I just don't see it. At this point, I lost it. I said, he's right. I said, he's right. <laughs> we just don't see kitchen cabinets that are open, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with kitchen cabinets being open. And that was a big mistake right there, right? <laughs> Because I brought myself to this conversation, friends. Oh, and this is a big point of contention between me and Kristen. I can honestly get up in the morning, grab a cup of coffee, uh, grab a mug out of the cabinet, pour myself a cup of coffee, get a plate out of the cabinet, get some, make some toast, you know, make some omelets and sit down, have a wonderful, beautiful breakfast. And it is just wonderful because I don't see that there are eight cabinets that are open right or all around me. The spice door is open. The fridge is open behind me. Right? I just don't see it. This drives Kristen crazy. Why did they put doors anyway on cabinets? It's a different sermon. I won't go there today. Right? But the more I think about that, right, that just, how many of you are part of this you just don't see kitchen cabinet doors open. Please, I need to start a support group. 
Thank you, Chow. Thank you, Kristen. We really need a support group. We need to, like, you know, send people in to, like, take out all those cabinet doors. Anyway, I, I digress, right? But <laughs> Dan's like, absolutely not. <laughs> right? But here's the point. We just don't see it. Honest to goodness, it is not intentional. It is not to drive the other person crazy. It is not to drive Kristen crazy, or in this case, this couple, the other person crazy. We just don't see it. it. We just don't see it. I think that statement, I just don't see it, is a perfect illustration of this parable that we just re read this morning. I just don't see it. I just don't see it. So let me share this parable to you and just kind of break it down as to what this parable is. Uh, this parable is called the parable of the final judgment. Here Jesus is teaching uh, his disciples about what it means for when he comes back. When the second coming of Christ happens, what is going to happen? That is what Jesus is teaching here. Verse uh, Matthew 25, verse 31, we read, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the people one from another, a shepherd who separates the sheep from the goat. And he will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. See, Jesus often taught in parables and to illustrate a spiritual truth. And here, again, Jesus, as I said, is talking about the final judgment. On that day, when Jesus comes back, each one of us is going to be judged for our actions. On that final day, each one of us is going to be held accountable for what we did and for what we didn't do. Here, Jesus comes in his glory. And I can't imagine what that would look like. Because every time when I read the scriptures and God's glory is revealed, it is absolutely wonderful and magnificent. And I just, words cannot describe it. And I wonder what that scene would look like when Jesus comes in his glory. And all the nations that are gathered before him. Here the word all nations refers to all of humanity. Greeks, Gentiles, Romans, every single person is before the throne of Christ. And there Christ is seated on the throne. And Christ is here again, is identified as the one who's seated on the throne, meaning that Christ is God. He is the one who's seated on the throne, and he is separating the people, sheep on one side, goats on the other. And this is something that I want to point out this morning when I say that the Son of Man, that Jesus seated on the throne, is the one who separates everyone who's before him. The sheep to the right and the goats to the left. It's Christ who separates. It's Christ who who holds us accountable. Sometimes as Christian leaders and pastors, uh, or as just as individuals, we've kind of gotten into that role of sitting on the throne and condemning one and lifting the other up. Friends, I want to remind you, it is Jesus who separates the sheep from the goat. It's not for us to separate who goes to heaven and who doesn't. It is Christ. Jesus sat on that throne, and he was the one who was separating the sheep from the goats. So I just want us to be aware of that. It's not you or me or a pastor or a pope who can say who is part of the sheep, who is part of the goats. It is Christ himself who is going to do that. So let's be very mindful, especially when we begin to judge our neighbor. After separating the sheep from the goats, uh, Jesus does something. He gives reward to some and condemns the other. Verse 34, this is what we read. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But to those on the left, the king looks at them and condemns them. Read in verse 41. 
Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The question for us to ponder this morning is why are the sheep given the inheritance of the kingdom of God and eternal life while the goats are condemned to eternal fire? This crazy proposition that we find ourselves in, it all depends who you are. If you are the sheep, good for you. If you are the goat, not so good news because the sheep are given eternal life. And let's see why the sheep are given eternal life. Here's the reason why they're given eternal life. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. For I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Here are the things that the righteous did. Feeding the hungry, caring for the stranger, showing hospitality, clothing the naked, caring for the sick and the imprisoned. The people described here in this passage, all of them live on the margins. When you think about our society or when you read human history, those who are hungry, who are strangers, who are sick, who are imprisoned, always find themselves on the margins. These individuals don't live in places of power, rather on the outskirts of power and our community. Think about it, when you are a stranger or a foreigner, that means you left what you call home, seeking something better. Being a stranger is something that the people of Israel were familiar with. They went into Egypt as strangers, as foreigners, because they wanted to avoid a famine. They were taken into exile into a new land where they were forced to learn new cultures and new language and live as foreigners. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16 and 19, we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Many of us are familiar with this story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had the best clothes. He ate well. But we read that Lazarus was at the gate, meaning that Lazarus was on the margins. He was not at the center of power, but rather on the margins. During Jesus' time, when somebody was considered sick, they were usually considered unclean. They didn't understand modern medicine. So the practice was when you got sick, you were put in quarantine. We know a thing or two about being isolated when we get sick. Those in the center of power were never isolated. Finally, we're told about those who were imprisoned. Those in, who are in prison in some ways are the worst offenders in this story, in this list, if you will. Because those who are in prison most likely were deceiving and stealing their own people. These individuals were in prison because of their, it's a direct consequence of their actions. And I'm willing to agree that during Jesus' times, the Roman Empire, Empire led with an iron fist. They did not tolerate zealots or anyone creating trouble. Those who stole, fought, deceived, were sentenced and thrown into prison. End of story, no exceptions. Those who were identified as the sheep cared for the stranger. Those who were identified as the sheep cared for the hungry, the sick, the imprisoned. And because they cared for them, they received a blessing, the blessing of eternal life. On the other hand, the goats did not care for the stranger or the hungry, the imprisoned, the thirsty, or the naked, and they were condemned. The king's response to the sheep is this, as you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And the king's response to the goats is this, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Friends, here's a nugget that I want us to focus on. This nugget has shaped my calling as a Christian. This nugget has shaped my identity and it is hope that this shapes your identity, that this principle 
guides you. And here is the big reveal. Here is the big reveal, the aha moment that I want you to consider. When you look at the story of the sheep and the goat, when you read their responses, what the sheep said in response to what Christ said, what the goat said in response to what Christ said are absolutely identical, word for word. The sheep and the goat both respond the same way, saying, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did you see you a stranger or naked or in prison? Both the sheep and the goat say the same thing. When did we see you? When did we see you? When did we see you? Friends, this is the key to understanding our parable. If you ask my daughter, when was the last time you loaded the dishwasher? I have two daughters. I'm not picking on one. Just saying it out loud. If you ask my daughter, when was the last time you loaded the dishwasher? You might hear a response like this. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, maybe I think. I don't know. I'm not sure. This is because my daughter does not, for better or worse, load the dishwasher. It's not one of her chores that she does. If you ask my son, when was the last time he had fun playing Fortnite? Fortnite is a video game that he got for Christmas. Both my sons got it. If you ask him, when was the last time you had fun playing Fortnite? You might hear a response like this. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe, well, I think. The reason my son responds that way is because every waking moment that he's allowed to play Fortnite, he plays Fortnite. That's all he does is play Fortnite. And the parable of the sheep and goats, it is consistently the same. I, when were you naked? When were you a stranger? When were you hungry? Friends, the sheep, this is what they did. They served so often is that they bumped into Christ and they didn't even know that they bumped into Christ. They served often and regularly. That they had no clue that they just bumped into Christ. Yesterday we did Bread of Life Ministries here at the church. And several individuals walked through our doors and the month before that we did it and we've been doing it for so many years and yesterday it, there were all kinds of individuals there there were young children youth adults older adults al was there celebrating his 81th birthday we all we all sang to him we bagged groceries and we did all kinds of things and we just might have ran into christ yesterday and we had no clue that we bumped into christ because one day Christ is going to look to us and say, you fed me when I was hungry. And we all are going to say, when were you hungry? Christ just might say, I was at bread of life. And you said, when? Friends, we are called to do this often and well. When we serve those on the margins, we have an opportunity to run into Jesus himself. When we are praying, we are, as a church, uh, praying and thinking about launching other service opportunities beyond Bread of Life. So that each one of us has an opportunity to run into Christ as we serve. It is my prayer that as we serve, that we can repeat this over and over again and say, just like the sheep said, when did we run into you, Jesus? When did we run into you? I had no idea that we helped an older adult family with home repairs and we didn't realize that you were there or we helped mentor a kid and didn't realize that you were there i had no idea that jesus i ran into you when we when i gave offering to help feed the hungry in coatesville through our christmas offering when 
when did we run into you? That is my prayer and I, my hope for this church, that we serve so often and in so many areas that one day we can say, when did we run into you, Jesus? Friends, for the past three weeks, uh, we've been looking at what is Mount Hope all about. We started out the sermon series talking about Pastor Tom Hawk uh, asking me bluntly, what is your church about uh, over a dozen years ago? And kind of asking that same question as Mount Hope, what is Mount Hope all about? And we kind of declared a couple of things over the past three weeks, that we'll be a church that is committed to unity in the midst of a divisive culture that we would be committed to caring for one another, that we would be committed to being in fellowship through life groups and Sunday schools, that we will be committed to being in community so that we can hear and learn about each other's life, that we'll be intentional in caring for each other, that we'll be intentional in being with each other outside of a Sunday morning worship. And finally, we are looking at these words from the parable of the sheep and goats, where we are called to serve. I hope that these three things would guide us to create our identity as a church, that we'd be a church that is committed to unity, a church that is committed to life groups, and a church that is called to serve beyond the walls of these, beyond these walls, to those who are on the margins. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this church called Mount Hope. We thank you for everyone who's part of this church family and for all those who will be part in the days to come. And God, we pray for those who are not yet here, that you would prepare their hearts. And God, that you would prepare our hearts, that we would be ready to welcome them, usher them in to your kingdom. God, help us to be a church that is committed to bearing one another in love, committed to serving those on the margins. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.